people that are struggling with desire often feel like something is wrong with them. They feel like they're broken. They feel like they're inadequate. They feel like they're failing their partner. They feel guilty. Where would you take your life if you knew you could not fail? I get it. As a stepmom, mom, and entrepreneur, sometimes it can feel like what everyone else expects of you versus what you dream about for yourself are on opposite ends of the spectrum. As a woman, you're taught from a very young age what society thinks you're worth based on how you look, how you behave, and how much money you're allowed to bring in. But I'm here to show you that you can be the woman who has it all, and not just on the outside. I'm Brittany Lynch, and you are the queen of your castle. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of the Queen of Your Castle podcast. I am your host, Brittany Lynch, and I have one sexy guest here for, for you <laughs> ladies today. On the show, we've got Jessa Zimmerman, and Jessa Zimmerman is a sex therapist. So she is here to talk to us about all things sex and desire and relighting the flame that many of us miss from those early, early days. So thank you so much, Jessa, for hopping on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So it looks like you are a sex therapist and you work in Seattle, yes? Right. That's okay. where I'm in private practice as a therapist working with couples. Okay. Um, but then I've got this whole other side of my business that's sort of available outside of the state of Washington where I'm licensed. So. Mm, okay. So tell me more about that. Well, I, a few years ago, in, in my sex therapy practice, I work only with couples of all varieties. And a few years ago now, maybe almost four, I published a book called Sex Without Stress. And it was based on the kinds of things I see with all my clients, which is they can have this, you know, pretty good relationship, but somehow sex becomes loaded and stressful and difficult. And somebody maybe is avoiding it. And that's just causing more strain and more pressure. And it becomes this whole cycle. Um, And then over time, I decided that book was really kind of a do-it-yourself process. So I turned it into a course. So an online course. And then that's evolved a little bit over the years uh, to where now I've got one specifically for women in this situation who are struggling with desire. Okay. And that one is called the desire spa. That's called the desire spa because (laughs) it really means a lot to me because, (laughs) because so much of this people that are struggling with desire often feel like something is wrong with them. They feel like they're broken. They feel like they're inadequate. They feel like they're failing their partner. They feel guilty. I mean, it's really a heavy, heavy burden. <laughs> and so I wanted this course to immediately suggest this like embrace. You are welcome. You are nourished. It's a place you can go and let go and just sort of do the work you need to do and then come out the other side without anybody pressuring you or watching you or waiting for you or any of any of that. So it's not like going to the doctor, you know, or going to the principal's office or go, you know, any of those sort of negative places. I really wanted to connote the spirit I'm trying to create there, which is, yeah, there's some work to do, but this is a real safe place to explore that and transform it. Sure. I get like, I get a really soothed body sensation when I hear desire spa. It feels like somewhere that I want to go. I know it's online. I know it's online. (laughs) Yeah. It's not a real physical place, but you know, but when you make the desire spa retreat, let me know. So yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds great. Um, I know that, you know, the, the kind of definition of desire is pretty simplistic and I'm sure that the mechanism behind desire is not simple. So can you explain to me like, what is desire? Where does it come from and what gets in the way of desire? (laughs) Uh, I mean, I don't know if there's really an answer to what is desire, but, um, so let me start with this, this concept that there's always desire discrepancy between two partners in a relationship. Someone wants more sex than the other person. Okay, so there is a higher desire person and a lower desire person, and those are relative to each other. Okay, so this is not broken. This is normal. This is universal because, you know, why would any two people want the same amount of sex, right? At least over time. Uh, But what will happen is these become kind of intractable roles. And someone who is a lower desire partner is going to have some real legitimate obstacles in their way. So when you just ask what gets in the way, there are so many things that can get in the way of somebody's desire. So when you're talking about step parenting, I mean, parenting is one of the big four in couples counseling, money, sex, in-laws, and parenting. Uh, Step parenting is like 
turbocharged parenting yeah. challenges, right? I mean, in the relation, if there's relationship dynamics that are a problem, anything that's going on with you individually in terms of your own mental health, your own sense of body image, your own sense of exhaustion and overwhelming work demands, you know, stuff that's going on in the couple, stuff that's going on in your life, all of this can, can really block desire. And then the other really key thing to understand when you're asking how does desire work, it kind of works two different ways. So the first way I call proactive desire. So this is like sex is on your mind. <laughs> you know, you're thinking about it, you get horny and so you're interested in doing this thing. Uh, and that's what we are sort of led to believe is what libido is or what sexual desire is and how it should feel. So when I get people in my work who say, gosh, if it were up to me, I could go the whole rest of my life without sex and be just fine. You know, they probably have access to the other kind of desire that I call reactive desire. So at least if we can minimize the obstacles they might have, reactive desire is when you start and you get a little physical and you give yourself time and you, you know, if you get the touch you need and the time you need, maybe your body wakes up, you know, maybe you get aroused like, oh, now I would actually like sex. And I say that to people who tell me they have no libido and they say, well, yeah, that happens. Like they don't count that somehow, but that's a really, really important idea. That's a valid way of having desire. And that's what most people don't understand. They've never heard this. They've always thought something's wrong with this. We got to fix that. We're supposed to just feel this like a hunger. It's like, no, no, no. We have to make space for reactive desire. Oh, that is such a good, that is such a good point to know because I mean, I'm seven months pregnant right now. So there is- oh. <laughs> So I can only see you from here up. So I did not know no <laughs> there's no horniness in this mind right now. Yeah. Yeah. Whatsoever. But, but the concept, i had never realized that desire could also be considered to be that. Like once you get in the groove, things start. Yeah, things start yeah. Working. yeah absolutely. And, and some people are more like that. It's not like this is our identity. I'm reactive and you're proactive. You know, it's, it comes and goes and we have different, you know, sometimes people tell me once a year or once a month, they get in the mood. But anytime you're not feeling proactive desire, you might be able to access reactive desire. And that's normal. There's nothing broken with that. And some of us are more like that our whole lives. Uh, I think all of us get more like that the older we get, uh, the longer we're with the same person <laughs> because the brain chemistry is different there, you know, under stress and, you know, illness, different things like that influence this. And so welcoming that, realizing that that's normal, we just have to work with that is really the key. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good to know. So in, in desire spa, for example, what specifically is it that you work on with women or help women work on with themselves? Is it to increase this proactive desire or is it to become more attuned to the reactive desire or is it both? Um, it's not really to create proactive desire. Like I think sometimes if we're moving other obstacles in the way, if we're getting, even getting rid of the idea that you're broken and something's wrong, maybe it's like, oh, maybe you're going to have more access to what proactive desire you might have, or if you deal with health issues or something like that. Mostly it's about under really changing the paradigm and understanding that reactive desire is there for you some percent of the time. Like, here's the other thing about it. Just because you start doesn't mean it's going to happen, right? Like people, if you're not in the mood and you get and you start somewhere between 5% of the time and 95% of the time, the engine turns over and you actually want to have sex. So it's about really kind of changing our thinking about all this, challenging the myths. The way I break the, the spa down is first you start in the soak room, like soak up a whole new paradigm and a whole new understanding of this and break down all the myths that we have been taught and like understand what's been going on and reset. And then you go into the scrub room, just sort of about exfoliating, right? Let's look at our baggage. Let's look at our past experiences. Let's look at all this messaging. Let's take apart this dance we've done with our partner and decide what to keep and what to get rid of. And then you go into massage, which is sort of like working it out in real life, right? Like real life ways to put some of the stuff into practice and to transform. So that's the way I've kind of designed it, but it's, it's more about creating space for and accessing reactive desire and really rethinking what counts as sex. Mm. Because for so many people, sex is like all or nothing. We either doing this thing or we are not. If we start, we have to finish. Like we have this idea that there's some sort of goal 
or something that's supposed to happen. And it, we really need to shake that up. So it's like all of this physical intimacy counts. We can enjoy all of it, no matter where it goes. It's not this sort of pass fail system. Oh, it's not a black and white system. It no, it is, it is not. Uh, the metaphor I use all the time is sex is like going to the playground, which maybe sounds too childish, but that's what comes to me. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's the outing that counts. You go to the playground, you don't have an agenda. It's not like we have to go down the slide. It's like, we just go and that's a win. And we do what we feel like when we're there. We enjoy what we're doing. Maybe we get inspired to stay longer and do more once we're going. It doesn't matter. So we have to treat sex like that too, that this is not a hierarchy and it only counts if we do, you know, whatever sex is to us, say intercourse or something, or it's all about orgasm. It's like, no, no, no. It's more like a circle or a playground and it's all fun. And we need that sort of flexibility and we need to take the pressure off of this sense that we have to do certain things or we have to feel certain ways uh, because that's, that will just kill desire. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That is, that is such a good point. And, and I wonder how hard it is to kind of change that conditioning I mean, you would know, but how hard it is to change that ki- to change that conditioning to think like only when you go to the park and go down the slide does that actually count as going to the park? Like, there's probably so much unconscious social programming that we have no idea even in yeah. our mind yeah. about what counts as sex and what counts as intimacy and what's good enough and what's not good enough and all of this. Right. Some of it we've never. Th- thought to challenge, you know, it's like the water we swim in it for fish, right? We don't even notice it. We just have always, we've just believed this without ever evaluating it. So sometimes people, I don't know, like sometimes they just need to hear it from me and it's like light bulbs. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and they can go off and run with it. And other times it's harder <laughs> to let go and to really shift. And of course, we're talking about both people meeting in a couple needing to make this shift. So you know, sometimes one person's really willing to, I love this idea of the playground, but the other person's really attached to some particular thing. And so it might take a little bit more persuasion, but, but what will happen is the people that are looking for help, you know, who are either coming to me in therapy or enrolling in my program already know they're suffering with this. Like they know something isn't working with the way this has, they've been approaching this. It's not changing. Like they're, they're pretty eager to adopt some new way that offers hope of actual, you know, intimacy, because, you know, sex is about pleasure and connection. It's not about what you do with your body parts or orgasm or some particular goal. It's about let's, let's dramatically improve the pleasure and connection the two of you are sharing. Mm -hmm. I, I have this question coming to me, so I want to ask it in that, you know, we hear all of the time that, that the quality of your sex life is a reflection of the quality of your relationship. And I want to know what your thoughts are about that sentiment. Um, I don't know that I totally agree with that. The way I put that is the quality of our sex life is directly related to the quality of our relationship, but I, but it can go either way. So if your relationship is struggling and you've got resentment or power struggles or serious communication challenges, or you don't like each other, or there's, you know, whatever it is, of ultimately that will get in the way of your sex life. But it's also possible. I see tons of people and actually in my work, I mostly work with people who are in really pretty good relationships. There's a lot of goodwill, you know, and respect and love, and they'll say they're best friends, but somehow sex isn't working. So it's not like, and this is where sometimes people will say, oh, we just have to go learn communication skills. And then our sex life will fix itself. No, I work with all kinds of people with a really strong relationship, but sex can still be a problem. But that can start to undermine the strength of your overall relationship. Right. People will tell me, I know we could feel closer or more connected. You know, it hasn't broken us up, at least not yet, but it's but it starts to create some distance with a partner. And that's that's largely the reason people come in for help, because they want to feel as close and connected as possible. And they know that there's like this basically this elephant in the room. Mm, super good. So what are some other ways that that couples can work on their intimacy and their connection aside from just like traditional penetrative sex? 
<laughs> well, I mean, you know, when we talk about working on intimacy and connection, right, there's sort of like physical intimacy, your sexual intimacy, and then there's emotional intimacy. And I don't see those as like totally separate things, but often one person really needs to feel connected before they're going to be open to having sex. And I don't know, life's great irony, often the other person needs to be having sex to feel really open and emotionally close. It's like, that's where their heart opens. And so it's not like all you want is sex or that. I mean, it's, it's not a bad thing to them. It's sex is emotional. They may not phrase it that way, but I think that's what's happening. So it's like, we have, it's chicken and egg. We have to be working on both of those things, right. On physical affection and emotional connection. So on the physical side, I think this idea of adopting this, this concept of the playground, can we just prioritize some time to be physical? Whatever that would look like for you is like a next step, a little bit more than what you're doing now. You know, so sometimes it's just like, can we go to bed at the same time or go to bed naked? Other times it's like, can we shut, lock the door and have some sort of sexual encounter? Um, but creating some space for that to be happening without any particular expectation about what happens. Unless you're both already in the mood for sex, then great. Right. So not having the pressure. And then on the emotional side, it's also about prioritizing in time and spending time talking to each other, spending time having fun, having hobbies, going out, you know, being away from the kids, away from the screens where you can focus on each other. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think, you know, I, in my, in my own life, especially, you know, I have this, like, I have this, it's like when I'm in, when it's daytime, I I'm in this box of like parenting and owning a business and running a business. Yeah. And then it's like the kids go to bed and the door closes and it's like, I'm still in that box of like, go, 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 go. Right. Yeah. And it yeah. feels really hard to transition into a place where I even want to be in my body because I'm, yeah, yeah. Because I'm so wound up from the day. And I wonder, I mean, I don't even have to wonder. I know that this is a common experience, especially right. with 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 women and mothers and and busy professionals um why is it that some people can just like get in the mood and other people need some like time to wind down and get out of their like productive box <laughs> <laughs> I don't I mean I don't know the answer to why that's different for people I just know that it is different for people and nobody is broken but I think it's a practice so somebody like you who has a heart, you know, got a super busy life and go, go, go and all this different stuff, you probably need some sort of practice and ritual around shifting gears that symbolizes to your brain and your body that you're walking out of that box and into a different one, <laughs> you know, so whether that's a walk or a shower or a cup of tea or a conversation or, or meditation or, you know, it could be almost anything, but something that would become this trigger, like I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to consciously let go and shift. And it, it would start to be easier and easier, I think, to make that transition because your body would recognize, oh, I've turned off the light, shut that door and sitting down with a cup of tea. Uh, but it's a practice, you know, and it's, it's really worth putting into place as some way to shift gears. For sure. I mean, it sounds, it sounds fantastic. I, I, have, <laughs> I, I have evening rituals, but I haven't made the connection to turn that into, uh, like a switch to my brain to be like, okay, let's get ready to do it now that we're having our tea, but it's not about that. Right. It's just, about yeah, it's not about getting ready to do it, but it is about maybe getting into the role of partner and potential, I mean, I want to say lover, but I don't mean that in like a goofy way. Again, not like, okay, got to have sex tonight. Like, but it's more like, can I get into my body and into my relationship and connect and make space to start something, whether it's a conversation or a physical encounter. And, and again, be open to see where it goes. This is a playground. There's no pressure. There's no like have to do it tonight. That, that will kill desire over time is any sense of obligation, but more like, Hey, I've been in the mom role and the business role all day. Can I get in the partner role now? Sure. The, the woman role, you know, this, this makes me think of a question, you know, this, this, um, having sex out of obligation. I'm curious about this distinction of, of having sex out of obligation and how that might be confused with, reactive desire because in that state it's like 
I don't really want to have sex, right? If I'm t- attuning to reactive desire, I don't really want to. I'm not I'm not looking for it. I'm not I'm not looking for it at all. So how do you how do you like how, do you understand the question I'm asking? How do you get I think from so. the I place think so. of like doing it cuz you feel like you're supposed to versus being with your body long enough to get into the reactive desire? Yeah. I, I mean, this is, this is part of why the massage room and the spa is so important. Like how do you practice this stuff in real embodied ways? So you learn where that line is for you, because there's a difference between like, let's say we're going to schedule time to go to the playground because it's important because we're trying to prioritize this. We're trying to make space for this in our life. You may not feel exactly like going just like if you were actually going to a playground. Maybe I don't really want to go. But once you get there, <laughs> oh, okay, I'm here. What do I actually want now? Like, it's it's so important to learn what am I open to or what do I want in this moment? And where am I pushing or doing something I don't want or out of obligation? And you don't want to do that, <laughs> right? It's like, but wait, if we, if we went in the bedroom and shut the door, maybe I would really like to be held. Mm-hmm. Or maybe some massaging would feel good. And then once we're doing that, maybe some kissing would feel good. But if it doesn't, like that needs, that needs to be a line. Right. And, and there's, there's such a difference. Like we can have sex with our partner for them. You know, I'm not really in the mood, but you really are. And I'd love to participate with you, you know, and feel good about that. Even though we're not really turned on, uh, we're, we're not really getting anything like sexually out of it for ourselves, but we can do that from a place that feels okay or even really good, or we can have sex for our partner in a way that we don't want to be, we don't want to be there. We're gritting our teeth. We're getting through it. We're feeling more resentful. We're feeling shut, closed, shut down, right? Like it's, we can be doing the exact same thing and it can be a totally different felt experience. And it's really, really important to learn the difference between those things Mm -hmm. because the second one will really kill your sex life over time. Mm -hmm. Anytime you're having sex out of obligation, that just doesn't feel good. And it's really not fulfilling for your partner either. I mean, they may think, oh, at least I'm getting some, but they're not, it's, it's hurting them too. For sure. There's a, there's a phrase that's coming to mind. I'm in a, I'm in a huge group of moms on, on Facebook and it's talked about so frequently, this concept of like maintenance sex, like mm-hmm. we had our monthly maintenance sex, just to, just to have the monthly maintenance sex. And it's like, that doesn't, it doesn't even feel good to like read about it, but it's this, it's this super common experience like there's a whole it's it has a term behind it right like there's yeah, a yeah. understanding that people know what you mean when you say that it's so interesting i just had somebody respond to an instagram post today cuz i put out this little reel about don't schedule sex you know schedule opportunities to be sexual cuz i think there's a big difference scheduling sex means i have to show up and do a certain thing to a certain outcome whether i want to or not and i think that's damaging over time but this person responded and said you know what for a year my partner and i have been scheduling sex for saturday mornings and we actually really enjoy it we kind of look forward to it and it's like well that's not a problem and i wouldn't i guess maybe it's language like i if if you're scheduling these chances to either have sex or be sexual and you're feeling good about them and you're do, even if you're just doing that intentionally and you put it on the calendar you don't necessarily feel desire but you get into it once you're there that's, that's great. I don't know if I'd call that maintenance sex, but I do think that's like intentional. Right. And then the other side of this is I have to show up and do this to keep my partner happy or so I won't lose them. And I don't want to be doing it. It's so much about how you feel in the doing of it. I don't want to be here. I wish this weren't happening. I really don't want to be doing this. Like once we cross this line from, I can do this and feel good about it to I'm doing this and I don't want to, that's where it's a problem. Right. Right. So it's, it's not really the intentionality or the scheduling or the planning that's the problem. It's like, how does it feel to be doing it? Mm-hmm. And, and how would you recommend communicating to a partner about like where you're at? Because I, f- I feel like this can become such a, such a, like an ingrained dynamic in a relationship where it's either you're having the maintenance sex and your partner knows you're having the maintenance sex out of obligation where it's like when you get to this point where you're trying to fix it, fix I for lack of a better <laughs> for lack of a better term, not that anything's broken. When you're getting to a place where you're trying to shift the dynamic, we'll put it. Yeah, yeah. It. How do you communicate with your partner? Like, yes, I really actually do want to. I'm not just having maintenance sex, or you know, I really don't. And then that like fragile kind of rejection 
fear there of like, how do I tell you that I don't want to without worrying about rejecting you? And how do I actually let you know when I'm authentically, <laughs> when I actually do want to without you thinking that I don't want to, right? Because this, I feel like this gets really messy really fast. Yeah, yeah. And so for, for it gets my brain going a lot of different directions. So for a higher desire person, one of the traps they fall into is taking their partner's level of desire personally and taking it like they're being rejected as opposed to you're with somebody whose desire works differently. And it's not personal. I mean, you know, if you're doing anything to make it worse, stop that. But basically, it's not, it's not personal. So I think couples need these concepts of the playground of reactive desire, realizing that just because we start doesn't mean for no one are you going to end up in the mood 100% of the time. So you need this understanding of can we treat this differently? Can we start with no expectation, not be attached to it going a certain way? Can we get lighter about this? Can we enjoy what we're doing? Because the the offshoot will be more desire because if the pressure is off, when you go to the playground more of the time, you're going to end up, Oh, actually now I really am interested in sex more than if you just went through the motions and, and keep in mind that your higher desire partner who is receiving this maintenance sex is, I, I mean, I don't know if I say hundred percent is unfulfilled. Your partner longs for you to want to have sex with them. They want you to want to be there. And if you are going through the motions and doing something you don't want, they can tell this. And this is not fulfilling either. So it's sort of like this junk calorie, junk food, no calories, no nutrition to it, you know? And it's like, you're both sort of starving. You're, you're enacting something together that's really kind of unpalatable and making it worse. And so if you can speak to, you know, your partner about, I know you actually want me to want to be doing this with you, you want to share this with me, can re, re sort of reimagine how this whole thing works so that, so I can actually want this with you and we can enjoy this together and we can actually be sharing pleasure and connection and not just about, you know, tab A and a slot B. <laughs> I have a, I, with, along with your park metaphor, I have this like visual of, of a parent pushing a kid on their swing set and like being on their <laughs> phone at the same time. It's like, <laughs> I don't want to be here doing this, but I'm right. Good, right. right. So I'm good. It's going to get through it. get over it. But yeah, but I especially love this, like this emphasis that, that you're, that you're pointing out of allowing it to be about pleasure and connection rather than. Yeah. Yeah. Instead, instead of about outcome and goal. And again, this can be such a huge paradigm shift for people because we have been raised or enculturated, whatever, to sort of think, you know, sex is when we put a penis in a vagina and it has an orgasm. And it's like, that's all that counts. And that's the whole point of all the foreplay is just to get to this. I mean, it's so, this goal orientation is so ingrained, but it creates so much pressure for someone who does not, is not feeling desire for that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking about, you know, where this par this paradigm came from. Um, and I have a, my stepson is, is turning 14 very shortly. And so the conversations about like condoms and porn and all of those things have started happening in our home. Um, and, and for me as a, as a woman and as a parent, I'm like concerned that these concerned that these paradigms are being perpetuated of like seeing sex the first time you have that you experience what sex is it's like through a screen watching it in porn which is not the way that sex is supposed to be most of the time probably right right and 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 this is just getting passed on through our through from generation to generation of like this is what sex is supposed to be it's supposed to be for the man it's supposed to be penetrative da, 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 da. and and so I'm looking I guess for some some wisdom of like all, all of our listeners who are raising kids, most of our listeners who are raising kids right now in this day and age where the first experience we have with the sex is through, through a screen. And like, how can we, how can we support our kids to develop kind of a, a healthier idea of, of sex and intimacy of it being about pleasure and connection rather than just like making it look like the way that it looks in porn. Yeah, I mean, this is this is slightly out of my wheelhouse, but I have some thoughts about it. I mean, first of all, this whole paradigm existed way before porn. Um, so I think this is ancient, you know, I mean, you know, and I've had different guests on my podcast with different 
ideas about, you know, sort of religious cultures or is it the patriarchy or whatever, but this idea that sex was only for procreation, talk about goal oriented, right? <laughs> that the women shouldn't have pleasure sort of from a, you know, Puritan kind of upbringing or something like that. I mean, there's all kinds of influences that I think perpetuate this story that it's about a goal. It's a specific thing. Maybe it's only for a guy in a heterosexual relationship. And then we add on the availability of something like porn uh, that is all fantasy, right? And this is not generally real sex between real people. This is produced and, you know, there's effects and it's, it's amplifying little slivers of sexuality to appeal to different people's eroticism. I, I think the, I think there's sort of two different things. One is to do the best job you can in your own sex life and your own relationship with your partner. Basically, I think it's hard to promote something that we're not living. Like we got to walk the walk. So I think taking on your own issues around sexuality and wrestling with that and transforming that for yourself is really important. And then I think we got to be open. We got to be able to talk to our kids about this. We should be able to say sex is about pleasure and connection. And you probably see things on the internet that, that show something else. I mean, you know, what, what messages do you want your kids to take away about your own values around this and your beliefs and, and acknowledge that porn is out there and maybe you've seen some of this stuff and do you have questions and this is what it might lead you to believe. Um, but the more we can talk openly, which it's going to be hard to do if you haven't kind of wrestled with your own sexual, I don't know, hangups or problems or issues, discomfort <laughs> with the topic, you know, so take that on in your relationship. Mm -hmm. I do have to, I do have to acknowledge that like the conversation of sex has become, become a lot less uh, taboo, I think, than it than it used to be. It seems that parents, especially like my millennial generation of parents, are are much more open about about talking to their kids about sex, um, which is great. But, yes. But we also have a lot of collective healing to do around sex and around paradigms that that, right. that sex has been built upon for, like you said, ancient since ancient times. Right. Right. So if you're in the Seattle area <laughs> <laughs> or not, or not, yeah. um, is that kind of the most common well, I'm going back? I'm sorry. I, sh I didn't, That's okay. I, I zipped back to the desire thing in my mind <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't bridge the gap there <laughs> in your, in your practice, in both your like private practice with couples and in your online offerings, your digital offerings, is desire kind of the biggest, the biggest thing to work on um, that you see? Or is there, are there a couple of other areas that, that couples and individuals can struggle with often? Well, I mean, desire discrepancy, like I was saying, is universal. And so I would say that it is being experienced as a problem probably universally in my clients and in my students. Um, so that understanding about desire, about the nature of desire discrepancy, about the kinds of ways that goes wrong and how each person needs to approach that differently. I think that's universal. But then we can throw on there, especially in my therapy practice, people with sexual dysfunction. I mean, people in my, in my course have this too. They have pain with sex or they're going through menopause or somebody's got ED, you know, erectile dysfunction or, um, and you know, un, unable to orgasm or whatever it is that those just make this more and more complicated, you know, and sometimes there's medical treatments for this stuff. And sometimes we have to adapt because it's a, a permanent change in our functioning due to some illness or age or something like that. Um, all of that though, still involves reimagining what sex is, what it's for, how it works and what counts, <laughs> you know? So it's like, if somebody has got pain with intercourse, for instance, Maybe that's medically treatable. I mean, often it is, right? It's hard. It can be very difficult to find a doctor to give you a really good diagnosis and work with you because most doctors haven't had a lot of great training about sexual function. Uh, but sometimes that's resolvable, but sometimes not. So then we're talking about intercourse is basically off the table. What else can you do together, right? Maybe there's grieving around that loss, but it's about reimagining, okay, what, how, how are we gonna create the best sex life we can have with the parts that we've got that work and don't hurt, you know? Right, so. right, I love that. And I feel like this approach takes so much or allows people so much permission to just be 
who they are in their bodies without yeah. judgment or without feeling like there's something wrong with them or yeah yeah, yeah. it's it's I think you're right I think it's so much about permission and there's relief in that and there is often grieving because we had ideas about how it was supposed to be or we had experiences in our body that we used to enjoy and don't anymore or we have things we want and our partner can no longer do that and that is a real loss I mean, it really, really is. So it's important for people if they're in that place, if they need to, to recognize it is okay to grieve these realities, you know, and it's okay to be sad about that. It's really okay if you can't have your favorite thing anymore, (laughs) that you would grieve that. But then it's, you know, then we get to this permission and embrace, okay, what's possible? What are we going to do from here out and realize that that can also be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Like I can never have chocolate chip cookies ever again, but oatmeal raisin is also really good. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> but I'm going to miss John. Yeah. Yeah. And it's okay to be sad about that. Right. And it's like, whether it's your partner who's, who can't do something anymore, or whether it's your own body that has somehow shifted, it's a loss, you know, when you can't do what you wish you could do. Mm, what a, what a, what a really important and beautiful thing to think about is that grief process. I feel like yeah. that is, doesn't get talked about a whole lot. Right. Uh, grief behind that. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jessa, is there anything else that you would like to share with our listeners today? Um, well, I mean, I have some various resources that might be of interest to people. Would this be the time yeah. to mention those? Yeah, that would be great. Let us know where we can find you if you if we can find you on social media, how to do that. If you've got any yeah. to share, sure, go ahead. Let us know. Yeah, so my, my website in, is intimacywithease.com. And on there, you can find my podcast. You can find my free training about how to want sex again. So it never feels like a chore. Um, You can find my newest thing, which is daily conversation starters. So you can get via text message. (laughs) Talk about building some emotional closeness. So what do we talk about that isn't kids or the jobs or, you know, COVID? Um, Yeah, basically all the different resources I have are on there. And then on Instagram, I'm at intimacy with ease. And then Facebook, I think it's just Facebook slash intimacy with ease. Okay. Amazing. We'll be sure to link those up in the show notes. Thank you so much for your time. You are welcome. Your wisdom. Um, It's been wonderful. I'm sure you've given everybody a whole lot to think about. Thanks, Jessa. You're welcome. I hope this episode got your wheels turning and showed you just how powerful you are. I would invite you to take 30 seconds and tap subscribe to this podcast. When you subscribe to the podcast, then rest assured you will never miss an episode. And in no time, spinning your wheels will be a thing of the past. Thank you for listening and subscribing. And if you enjoyed this episode, it would mean the absolute world to me if after you subscribed, you jumped on over and left me a five-star review and better yet, a written review. I am on a mission to let every mom and stepmom know that you can create the life of your dreams. And I need your help to change the world. The world needs us. Thank you so much for subscribing and leaving me a five-star review. I will see you next week. For more behind the scenes action and to get really up close and personal with me and our beautiful step family, jump on over to Instagram and follow me at the step queen. Don't be shy. Send me a DM, tag me in your posts, tag me in your stories. Let me know what you're up to and what about the podcast has been blowing your mind. I cannot wait to get to know you better. And Instagram is my jam. I love you so much. I love you so much. Make it rain, girlfriend.